Hi everyone, welcome back to Psychiatry Network. Um, sorry, I'm still putting in my earbuds. Uh, how's everybody doing? Um, welcome back. We uh, have a repeat guest today. It's Dr. Max Lipson Stein, um, and I'm about to add him to the video. All right. And uh, oh, hi. Hey. <laughs> Hi, I just put in my ear. <laughs> so thanks for uh, coming back. Oh, hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> yes, glad to be back. Are you tangled? My, I am very tangled. <laughs> um. oh. <laughs> Take your time. Um, so Dr. Lichtenstein was with us on Monday, for those of you who joined us. And um, he presented an article on transgender psychiatry. And tonight, he's presenting a second article on transgender psychiatry. And so I won't go through his whole bio. You can hear it on the last video. Um, I'll just say briefly that he is currently working at um, as an assistant professor of psychiatry at the ICANN School of Medicine. And um, he is working in the Center for Transgender Medicine and Surgery for the last two years. Mm -hmm. So welcome back. Hi. Yeah, so uh, today we're doing like another sort of article on uh, transgender health. This one is a more general article than the one uh, last week. Uh, and I actually used this article um, as a part of like uh, some assigned readings and intro courses for residents and uh, medical students who rotate with me uh, in a transgender oh, psychiatry elective. Um, so uh, it's called Transgender People, Health at the Margins of Society. And uh, it is an article from uh, 2016 in The Lancet. Uh, it's actually a uh, first piece in a three-piece series uh, in The Lancet on transgender uh, health. Uh, it was also included uh, five other shorter perspective pieces, uh, a CME module uh, from the same authors of those three pieces. Um, so uh, that's great. I got, I got my, my cook with me too. Uh, <laughs> Feel free. Yeah. Um, so the authors of this are sort of a collection of some superstars of, of trans medicine and activism. Um, the first author, Sam Winter, is a British psychologist and sexologist uh, in, in trans health. He's a board member on the World Professional Association of Transgender Health, or WPATH, um, which is the main body that provides recommendations uh, uh, for transgender health, not just uh, transgender mental health. Um, Milton Diamond is probably the most sort of famous person uh, on this list, uh, I think, to the general audience. So anyone remember, like, the John Joan case uh, with John Money in the 70s? So uh, it was the person who um, he'd had a, a Bosch mm -hmm. circumcision and then was reassigned to female, uh, by, uh, and then John Money, at John Money's um, re recommendations, and then was raised as a woman. Uh, his name was David Raymer. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that turned out terribly. Uh, and Milton Diamond was the person who uncovered that. Um, uh, John Money had put out a number of um, follow-ups uh, that were sort of not very, uh, uh, didn't really show the full story of what was going on. Unfortunately, David Raymer wound up uh, uh, dying by suicide mm. uh, later on. But Milton Diamond is a Hawaii-based MD, PhD sexologist uh, who works in sexual health. Um, uh, Jameson, or James Green, is an American uh, transgender activist and board member on WPATH. Uh, Dan Karask is a San Francisco-based psychiatrist uh, on the WPATH um, Standards of Care uh, work group. So he helps develop the standards of care. Um, uh, that's probably the biggest publication from the WPATH, uh, currently in its seventh edition, I believe. Um, and uh, he's also active in a lot of professional organizations like the APA and AGLP. Uh, Terry Reed is a British activist for rights and transgender children. He, she was actually the person who I found the least information on. Uh, and then mm -hmm. Stephen Whittle is a British legal scholar and activist. And uh, Kevin Wiley is a British um, psychiatrist and sex therapist. Uh, so a whole bunch of different people from a whole bunch of yeah. different disciplines, uh, from lawyers to activists to um, uh, psychiatrists. Um, I'm not going to go over in great detail uh, terms. We kind of talked about that last time. Mm -hmm. um, but very briefly, so gender identity is the uh, gender that, uh, the internal sense of one's own gender. Uh, assigned sex is the sex um, one is assigned at birth, usually male or female, and usually by a doctor. Uh, gender expression is sort of one's external manifestations of one's internal gender, can have masculine and feminine aspects. Um, one uh, important term that 
uh, they, they talk about in this uh, article that I like a lot is something called gender incongruence. So that's the uh, st state of incongruence between one's assigned sex and one's gender identity. Uh, it doesn't put a, um, a stigma on it or a, uh, uh, a notion of pathology on it like gender dysphoria sometimes can. So uh, gender incongruence doesn't necessarily have uh, dysphoria mm -hmm. associated with it. Um, and it's a term that's used pretty frequently throughout this article. Um, and also gender variance is another thing they talk about to describe uh, sort of gender minority uh, populations, um, another one I like. Um, and oh, uh, general transgender is a person who's uh, in general, whose gender uh, identity does not match their assigned sex and someone who is cisgender, their gender identity does match their assigned sex. Um, okay, so uh, let's jump right into gender affirming healthcare. So, uh, Gender affirming health care can include things like hormone therapy, uh, surgery, and or mental health care. Um, it encompasses everything from uh, adolescence through adulthood in uh, children, in, um, children and, and young adolescents, things like uh, hormone blockers or GNRH blockers, uh, and sex and hormone replacement therapy for um, uh, adults and adolescents. Uh, treatment outcomes uh, on gender dysphoria are very good. Uh, when evaluated as hormone therapy or evaluated um, in combination with surgery or mental health or wraparound services. Um, so it's pretty much unequivocally the treatment of choice right now for uh, gender dysphoria. Um, there's other things we need to consider when uh, talking with uh, transgender patients uh, uh, and thinking about their, their whole health care are things like gamete storage. So people who undergo surgery or who are on hormone therapy are going to have reduced fertility. Uh, so they may need to do things like sperm banking or egg storage uh, before, um, uh, before they go on um, uh, those type of treatments. Uh, this can be cost prohibitive. It's currently, as far as I know, not covered at all by um, insurance. Uh, and um, this is an article that is uh, largely based on a European um, model. It talks a lot about the ICD and the WHO. Uh, the United States, I'm, I'm almost 100% sure no one covers that. Um, things like silicone removal uh, is also important to know about. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and um, also uh, important to remember to screen for things like diseases of birth anatomy. So stuff like prostate cancer in trans women and cervical cancer in trans men. So making sure that you have a GYN or a... Um, uh, a primary care doctor that you know works with trans people and uh, is going to be um, comforting to them in um, uh, those type of situations. Uh, so another thing they talk about in this article um, is uh, issues of intersex um, folks. So intersex is a term that's used to describe individuals who are uh, atypical um, in development in terms of some or all of their biological sex characteristics, which can include things like chromosomes, hormones, gonads, uh, or genitals, or all of the above. Um, issues of gender identity can arise in intersex people, but are not part of intersex conditions uh, themselves. So uh, intersex conditions are actually often not known to people who have them. Uh, and when they are known, they tend to be found out at birth. Um, and uh, right now, the preferred term for folks who, um, the, the term that was used for many years is uh, disorders of sexual development. And a preferred term by the intersex uh, associations is uh, differences in sexual development. Um, and one of the reasons why they're trying to move to this less pathologizing language is because uh, for many years, uh, there was something called the Hopkins model, uh, which is also uh, based on a lot of John Money's work, um, used uh, surgical modification of intersex genitalia. So basically they're uh, in very early life, they would try to make the uh, genitalia less ambiguous and usually female. Uh, unfortunately, down the road, this can lead to a lot of complications with sexual and reproductive functioning in adulthood. Um, uh, also, it can lead to later problems with gender identity uh, if it is different from the one that is surgically assigned. Um, so right now, the uh, organizations advocate a more open medical approach. So first of all, delaying any type of surgery uh, until gender identity is more clearly established. So waiting until um, the child or early uh, adolescent is able to uh, speak about their gender and their gender identity before doing this type of surgery. Um, wait until the child or, or adolescent can provide informed consent. Uh, 
And Malta uh, is probably the most uh, progressive uh, country when it comes to this. And they've actually outlawed sex reassignment on minors before informed consent can be established. Uh, of course, um, some of these intersex conditions do require immediate emergent surgery for urological or medical reasons. But um, just uh, cosmetic surgeries or surgeries to correct uh, gender mm -hmm. is uh, no longer recommended um, uh, by these international organizations. Um, so uh, also something that they talked about in the last article is what is the actual size of the transgender population? Um, this article also mentions that um, uh, if their uh, trans people are difficult to count. Uh, not all are public uh, about their gender identity and other people choose to uh, not transition uh, in their entire life. Uh, other people get hormones or in, um, most transgender people are counted at these clinics. Uh, and uh, treatment centers where um, hormones and surgery are performed. Uh, but many people decide to get hormones online or on the street uh, or from private doctors and not through gender affirming clinics. So they kind of remain invisible um, to these numbers. Uh, researchers tend to focus on the most easily counted subgroups. So people who seek gender affirming treatment at specialty clinics, uh, which uh, generally grossly underestimates the size of the population. Uh, more direct methods uh, with direct sampling um, uh, show rates anywhere between 0.5 to 1.3% of birth assigned males uh, are transgender uh, in adulthood and between 0.4 and 1.2% of birth assigned females. The average of these studies works out to about 0.5% um, overall mean, uh, which comes out to about 25 million people worldwide. And in the last study, uh, they one of the studies reported a number that was much, much smaller than that. Uh, and I imagine that's from those uh, limitations and the bias that uh, they, they talked about in this study. Um, and I think they present five studies of over 30,000 adults um, to get these numbers. Um, so that goes on to talk a little bit about biological correlates and development of gender dysphoria. Uh, there was most likely an interaction between underlying biology and social norms. Uh, uh, it's kind of true of everything these days. It's not just biology. It's not just social norms. It's an interaction of both of them. Uh, and there's no correlations um, it's, that have been uncovered in any studies to show uh, differences between parenting style and development of gender dysphoria. Also meaning that parenting styles that... Um, uh, enforce strict gender stereotypes have no impact on whether or not someone um, becomes gender, um, uh, transgender later in life. Um, uh, in intersex children, um, uh, corrective surgery, quote unquote corrective surgery, nor parental upbringing uh, guarantees that a child develops into the assigned gender. Uh, and um, this is also true, uh, not only in intersex children, but also in children with penile injury um, uh, early in life. So things like um, uh, circumcision, um, uh, or botched circumcisions, I guess is the, the term. Uh, uh, early brain development uh, seems to have some effect. Um, things like genetic markers and prenatal hormones seem to have the, the most correlation so far, but there's no real direct uh, correlation that we've um, been able to establish. Um, uh, in transgender women, repeat polymorphisms in the androgen receptor have been something that's come up a couple times. So maybe androgen or uh, transgender women are responding differently to uh, testosterone than uh, um, uh, cisgender men are. Uh, chromosome abnormalities like uh, XXY and XYY individuals uh, with male phenotype are associated with an increased risk of uh, gender incongruence. Um, and XY fetuses exposed to anti-androgens are associated uh, with increased rates of gender dysphoria later in life. So um, uh, XY fetuses uh, whose mothers are taking anti-androgens. Um, uh, so in twin studies, uh, our, our favorite kind of studies, uh, the 33% of assigned sex male monozygotic twins were concordant with transition later in life. Uh, and 23% of assigned sex female monozygotic twins were concordant with transition later in life. Um, and concordance among dizygotic twins is uh, extremely low. So uh, there is some sort of genetic component, um, uh, but there is also a significant social component too. Um, uh, other things that were brought up actually in the last study that are also in this study are things like differences in what is called click evoked odo acoustic emissions 
Uh, so these sort of unconscious responses to uh, stimuli uh, uh, appear to more resemble gender identity than they do um, uh, sex assigned at birth. Uh, there's also sort of a, uh, a fun fact more than anything is there's a ra raised prevalence of left-handedness in uh, transgender people. Um, so uh, uh, they also talk a little bit about the odors that was brought up in the last study. Um, and uh, the postmortem staining of the uh, bed nuclei of the stria terminalis. Um, uh, so uh, what they kind of conclude from this is that neurobiology can perhaps predispose someone uh, to gender incongruence. However, there is nothing that can be used diagnostically right now to determine whether or not someone will develop gender incongruence later in life. Um, and what I think is probably the best part of this article is this, the next part, which is the rights and health. Uh, it's a great introduction to sort of um, talking about uh, uh, legal issues and social issues in a sort of medical context. So the first uh, uh, concept they bring up is something called minority stress. Um, so minority stress is experienced on a daily basis. It's uh, being viewed by others in society as sexually deviant, morally corrupt, unnatural, or mentally disordered. Uh, and can lead to things like poor health outcomes and um, uh, poor overall well-being. Um, uh, things that can lead to minority stress for trans folks, number one is uh, gender identity documentation can be difficult to come by. What can often reveal one's transgender status when one wants to re, um, uh, be presenting as um, the, their gender identity. Uh, it can lead to problems with police, lead to problems in um, all kinds of situations. Um, discrimination at the workplace uh, is another uh, big problem uh, in, with minority stress, um, which is caused un underemployment. Discrimination in education uh, leads to lower levels of um, educational attainment, increased rates of dropout. Uh, and uh, is discrimination within a family can lead to uh, lower um, financial means as well as uh, poor social support. Public spaces are also often off limits to transgender people, See, simply existing in the space, uh, including places like public bathrooms, uh, which is uh, one of the bigger political um, uh, issues in America right now, uh, is often uh, impossible for, for, trans, for transgender people. Um, so uh, that, all that stress causes trans people to live more on the margins of society. Uh, they're excluded from opportunities that are um, uh, present for the rest of the general population. Uh, this can cause uh, unsafe, uh, unsafe sex practices, uh, needing to use the black market economy to survive, so things like drug dealing and sex work, um, as well as increased rates of things like suicide and self-harm, which they went into a little bit more in the last um, uh, review that we talked about. Um, uh, one, I think, pretty striking statistic is that HIV rates are 49 times higher uh, than the background population in uh, transgender women. Uh, in, in certain countries. Um, uh, also, uh, there's a significant problem with harassment uh, from law enforcement and uh, morality laws. Uh, and when transgender pe uh, people are incarcerated, uh, they're often detained in improper facilities. So uh, transgender women are often placed with uh, cisgender men, which can lead to um, all kinds of problems that you can imagine, including sexual assault, being denied medical care, um, and a much higher rates of um, self-mutilation. Uh, violence is a huge problem in the transgender community. Um, uh, this number cited in this study was uh, there have been 2,115 killings of transgender people from 2008 to 2016, and I believe in Europe was where the data was collected from. Uh, and of uh, a population uh, they examined it was 35% uh, who expressed their gender identity, uh, these are among children, who expressed their gender identity between ages of kindergarten and 12th grade, experienced physical violence. 12% um, were sexually assaulted. 7% uh, uh, of transgender adults were physically assaulted at their jobs. Uh, and 6% were sexually assaulted at their jobs. Um, and then they also talk more about uh, suicide rates so uh, again, citing the, the U.S. Transgender Survey of 2015, 41% uh, of trans folks in the United States report a lifetime suicide attempt compared to 1.6% of the general population. Uh, they cite dis uh, discrimination, physical and sexual abuse, being recognized as transgender, 
internalized transphobia, which is measured through a scale, uh, poor education, unemployment, poverty, and the absence of social supports being a um, high risk factors for suicide, which are sort of true across the, the board for suicide. Um, uh, another uh, concept that they bring up that I think is really important is something called the stigma sickness slope. So uh, it's the sort of positive feedback loop of stigma and illness uh, feeding back into each other. So um, they've got a nice little graphic uh, in the chart. Um, so stigma leads to things like harassment and abuse from just people walking down the street, as well as discrimination and violence. This leads to social marginalization, uh, not being able to access um, uh, the legal system, economic uh, em uh, empowerment, or um, uh, social, social ladders. Um, this leads to poor social and emotional well-being, risky situations and behaviors, which then leads to sickness, poverty, sex work, HIV, AIDS, and sometimes death. Um, and that things like poverty, sex work, and AIDS then feeds back into stigma, which can worsen this whole cycle. Um, so uh, things like and social, hormonal, and surgical transition are associated with improved emotional health and well-being. Um, so that's the good news, is that we do know that transition, helping folks with transition, uh, can help them uh, in, their, in their lives, their well-being, and uh, to be more functional. Um, Unfortunately, this can be really difficult to access, especially in uh, many countries uh, where it's sometimes it's illegal. Uh, even in the United States, uh, most of these services are available largely in cities. Uh, mental health care is even more difficult to access. Uh, as I'm sure we all know, mental health care is pretty tough to, to find. Uh, even when uh, people do find providers, they're often underinformed, unsupportive, or even hostile towards uh, transgender health care needs. Um, and this is kind of outside the scope of this article, but the U.S. Transgender Survey uh, found just terribly increased rates for providers who encourage their um, uh, clients to tra uh, detransition, things like increased rates of homelessness, uh, uh, running away from home in adolescence, suicide, and um, especially things like engaging in, in uh, the black market economy, um, which incre increases risk for drug use and, and sex work. Um, uh, also, we need to recognize that there is sort of a parallel treatment system going on right now to um, the allopathic uh, treatment system. Uh, things like uh, free silicone, uh, which is this non-medical grade silicone um, that is uh, quote unquote pumped uh, into the buttocks or lips or breasts uh, of transgender women in order to achieve a more feminine appearance when things like traditional surgeries are not available. Um, uh, free silicone is uh, extremely dangerous. Um, it can uh, cause granulation tissue, massive inflammation, or even embolize and cause uh, like massive um, pulmonary emboli or even um, cerebral emboli. Uh, there's also uh, a lot of unmonitored uh, self-administered hormone therapy. Uh, folks I see at my clinic are sometimes coming to me after decades of giving themselves their own hormones, um, even, even now, uh, but especially extremely common back in the 70s, 80s, 90s. I'd say most people were getting their hormones um, either bought on the street or, or buying um, birth control pills uh, from their friends. Uh, but it's actually very easy. And uh, someone in my clinic showed me, showed me how, one of my, my clients showed me how, to just get uh, hormones from um, the Philippines, like in one click. Uh, they're not good uh, getting it monitored, or getting your, uh, particularly uh, estrogen levels monitored is really important for preventing blood clots. Um, but uh, other things uh, that are really important um, that are uh, needs of transgender people that are not being met are sexual health needs. Uh, so transgender women are often lumped in with uh, cisgendered gay men in, uh, in group studies, uh, which really doesn't give a great picture of what their sexual health needs are. Uh, their rates of HIV are much higher even than um, cisgendered uh, gay men. Uh, and we don't really know why. Um, the sex practices are uh, just not well documented um, in any literature. Uh, trans men's health needs are almost completely ignored. There is extremely little research and data on this. Uh, something that's extremely important in trans men's health needs is pregnancy. Uh, and we know very little about this. Uh, one thing that our clinic did that I think it made uh, maybe the Wall Street Journal was uh, a couple of providers at our clinic allowed um, a trans woman to uh, breastfeed her child. So providing hormone therapy and things like prolactin. 
uh, in order to allow her to uh, breastfeed um, uh, her young baby. Um, uh, something that I can, uh, that can be read sort of outside this article uh, are things like civil rights principles, like the uh, Yog Yak Arta principles, which are civil rights based principles, basically allowing people to live um, healthy and uh, fruitful lives, uh, which in this case, they kind of break down um, how they're often violated uh, in gender variant folks and sexual minorities. Um, and of course, laws uh, and legal protections have a huge impact on transgender people's well-being. Uh, certainly in, in many countries, imprisonment or death uh, is, is just simply the uh, punishment for being transgender, uh, but also things like denying gender recognition, uh, so not being able to change identity documents or names at all. Um, having onerous requirements for identity documents changes is also something that's currently being sort of actively worked through in many countries, um, particularly forced sterilization. So um, many countries, Japan most recently, I think it, there was something in the New York Times uh, last week, that uh, the courts of Japan upheld uh, forced sterilization uh, in order to change one's gender marker on one's um, uh, documents. Uh, so uh, legal protections in Europe, um, so eight out of the 49 EU member states, and this was before Brexit, uh, have no uh, measures to recognize transgender people at all. So of the 33 17, uh, that do uh, recognize transgender people, 17 impose this sterilization requirement. Uh, there are only 10 states that don't require any sort of medical intervention in order to change one's documents. So don't require hormone therapy. Uh, they don't require uh, surgical interventions. Um, so just 10. And there are only three states, uh, Ireland, Malta, and Denmark, that no longer require a diagnosis of gender dysphoria, or in um, uh, Europe's case, it would be transsexualism is the diagnosis that's used most often. Uh, and uh, Malta passed an even more um, uh, progressive law that's based on Argentinian law, um, which allowed uh, even uh, folks younger than 18 uh, to change their gender identity and, and name. Um, uh, and Malte, Maltese law actually went even further, which made it uh, criminal to um, operate unnecessarily on intersex children. Um, and there's a very strong intersex advocacy um, organization in Malta. Uh, so uh, other places around the, around the world, like New Zealand, Australia, Nepal, Pakistan, and India, uh, and all actually now the U.S. as well. This has happened since the article came out. They're uh, beginning to recognize gender outside the gender binary, so being able to put a uh, third gender on one's uh, license. Um, uh, and the last piece that's particularly relevant to uh, us is uh, the question of are, are transgender people mentally disordered? So uh, right now the gender dysphoria exists in the DSM-5, uh, and since a very long time, since at least the 1800s, when sex entered medicine as a uh, part of medicine, uh, transgender people were considered um, disordered. Uh, you have things like earnings and inverts in the old Freudian languages um, that were used to describe what we would consider transgender people now. Um, in uh, 2010, the uh, WPATH uh, issued a statement to I don't know, is this cutting out for anybody else? Uh, if anybody wants to comment, uh, I'm not hearing Max, but if anybody else can. Okay. Okay. Hmm. I think, <laughs> I think, uh, Dr. Lichtenstein just, uh, popped out of the video. Okay. And he's back. <laughs> okay. I don't know what happened guys. <laughs> uh, Hi. Sorry. I think I just lost the connection. Yeah, no, that's okay. Um, you froze initially and then disappeared. Yes. So I think um, you were saying something about the W pass. Yes. I think when it cut out. So uh, in the in 2010, so um, the the W pass uh, issued a statement 
to depsychopathologize um, that uh, we need to depsychopathologize um, uh, basically any diagnoses of transgender people worldwide. And I think I may have misspelled a uh, depsychopathologize uh, in the question, but it's not like a trick. <laughs> um, uh, so. Um, uh, that's based on a number of different principles that they, that they kind of go through briefly, uh, and I'll go through them briefly as well. So first, there's no really scientific evidence to pathologize uh, gender variants. Um, uh, we know that reparative therapies are not successful. Any sort of psychological interventions have either been shown to be damaging, unethical, or just not successful. Uh, and affirming uh, one's gender is actually the best therapy. It provides the most functionality, the least distress to the patient. Um, uh, and with a high stigma on mental illness, uh, we are adding to this uh, stigma sickness slope and reinforcing uh, discriminatory practices, especially in uh, middle and low income countries where mental illness is particularly, uh, uh, high discriminated, uh, particularly highly discrim discriminated against. Um, also, uh, by giving uh, folks a um, mental health diagnosis uh, or undermining uh, transgender people's claims uh, to recognition of their gender. They can simply be written off as uh, people who are mentally ill as, as happened with uh, homosexual people and, and bisexual people uh, in the uh, 50s and 60s. Um, so uh, the WPATH um, <clears throat> and international organizations, of course, recognize that based on many um, uh, countries' uh, health systems, a diagnosis is needed for treatment. Uh, certainly true in the United States. We have to bill an F code or whatever for every uh, insurance that we bill. So uh, in the United States, the code that we bill for is uh, F46.1, uh, which is, um, and again, the ICD doesn't have a gender dysphoria in it. So it's gender identity disorder or something called dual role transvestism, which I do not know what that means. But um, uh, in the ICD-10, uh, transsexualism or gender identity disorder of children uh, when dealing with children, are the currently um, most used diagnosis. Um, they're listed under mental and behavioral health disorders in the subcategory of disorders of adult personality. Many people find that um, di discriminatory, uh, as, as you can imagine. So uh, the proposals for the ICD-11 and the ICD-11 work group uh, include uh, the diagnosis of gender incongruence. Um, so that term we talked about at the beginning. So not putting a patholo pathologizing label on it and um, uh, just noting that there's gender incongruence. Um, in, it would be moved out of the mental health disorders uh, category into something called the conditions related to sexual health. Uh, there is also uh, some call for one in children, uh, which is controversial. So it would be gender incongruence in children. Uh, proponents say it can help, diagnose, uh, help the diagnosed uh, to uh, access services and that uh, most will grow into their assigned sex. Um, opponents, who include most folks in the transgender community, uh, and uh, the reading between the lines, people in this article, uh, advocate for no diagnosis. Um, they note that gay and lesbian people, um, particularly gay and lesbian children and adolescents, benefited greatly from the removal of a diagnosis uh, in the mental health category. Uh, and um, there's another uh, work group that was, um, uh, established, I think, in, I forget what they said it was. I think it was in Brazil in, in uh, 2013, uh, which advocated for only using Z codes, uh, uh, so the non-billable codes uh, for transgender people. I don't know if that would, again, work in the United States because we do need to use them, but uh, again, to try to um, uh, depathologize uh, gender variants as much as possible uh, while still getting people access to services. It's an, on it's an ongoing debate for sure. Uh, okay, so that's kind of the, the crux and the big points of this article. Um, uh, there's definitely a lot more in it. Uh, I really encourage you to read it through. It's, it's a, a really well-written mm -hmm. article. Yeah, it sounds like a great article. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing mm -hmm. and the additional insights, mm -hmm. as always. Mm -hmm. um, I did not see any questions that popped up um, so far, but you're always welcome. The audience is always welcome to add questions later. Mm -hmm. If we see them, we'll try to get them answered. So. Okay. Um, thanks again. Alrighty. This was a uh, highly informative and, um, the link is at the top of the post, but I also posted it in one of the comments to claim your CME. And, um, the next two weeks we're going to be covering, uh, geriatric topics. Um, 
a lot of dementia. <laughs> so for uh, the next four sessions. And uh, after that, we'll be switching to another topic. So, all right, guys, have a good night. And uh, lots of thank yous and a lot of uh, people love you uh, specifically. Yeah. So <laughs> maybe well, some thanks. friends. So, yeah. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Bye.